This talk, I'm afraid, <clears throat> I don't like to give this talk. Uh, this, this is technology gone wrong to some extent. And believe me, I have people I work with who never, as Rick said, never met a test they didn't like. So they're going to add it to what they do. And the latest one in chest, in chest pain and chest discomfort uh, and shortness of breath is what? BNP. Now, let's get the facts out of the way right now. BNP, it is a neurohormone, actually. It comes from, from nervous tissue, which just happens to be located in your left ventricle. And when you do this to the left ventricle, does it kick out more of that stuff? Yes, it does. There's no controversy about that. If you stretch the left ventricle, it will kick out BNP. Not a problem here. It's in response to ventricular volume. That's why it goes out. They've done all kinds of other things. It's, it's not just the pressure, it's the volume expansion. Fact. We use this test to differentiate heart versus non-heart in suspected CHF cases. That's what it's for. But it's get using for more than that now. Now I've got, this, I've got these zombies who someone comes in, they're 24 years of age, they have, they've had a, a slight fever and a cough. CBC, BUN, lights, glucose, and a BNP. See, this is fundamentally wrong. You never ask a question you do not want to know the answer to. Because then you've got to do something with it, don't you? We're going to talk tomorrow about taking blood pressures. Uh, and what do you do when you have to record that blood pressure on the chart and you didn't want to? But you've got to do something with it, right? You asked a question. What's the ultimate of that? Well, I never ask my wife if she's cheating on me. She seems happy. The children seem happy. What the hell am I going to do with the results of that question that's going to make me feel any better? That's all right. The guy's already been punished anyway. He had to have sex with her. Uh, so it's okay. But whenever you ask a question you don't know the answer to, you can get a false positive and then what are you going to do with the, see, what are you going to do with the false positive now? You're going to assume this 24-year-old who's coughing, has got a fever, has now just developed congestive heart failure? Well, that's the danger in turning people loose with a test. Because there are false positives and false negatives, and there's no reason to be getting the test if you don't need it. Question number one. How good is BNP in making the diagnosis of congestive heart failure? How good is it? Well, here's the, I'm going to explain the problem to you right now, is that you have to have a standard by which you judge the test against. And everybody's paper, the standard is different. In, in Article 1, American Journal of Cardiology, Journal of the, uh, yeah, Cardiology, 2001, this is, very, uh, this is very, fairly recent stuff, and it's all pretty good, but what they did is the gold standard is two cardiologists decided whether the patient was in congestive failure. What's the problem with that? It's what they thought, that's their opinion, and the two of them didn't always agree as to whether the patient was in failure or not. So how can you look at the data and know for sure? That's the problem with the test. Um, in this study, they considered, a, Article 1, 39% had congestive failure. BNP, the mean BNP, was 1,076, I think it's picograms per ml, uh, in patients who had the CHF. And it was 38 in people who they believed did not have the CHF. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Well, that's because if you look at the patient, the probability before you knew what the BNP was, in most of those cases, they said, yeah, that's congestive failure. You know, grandma's sitting there, she's had previous heart attacks, she has foam coming out her mouth. Oh look, the thing's up. And this is a mean, this is the mean number. You can't use the mean number on your patient, right? Remember the, the statistician who drowned a, a, a perfectly good team of horses in a river with an average de dip, uh, depth of 12 inches? That's exactly right. Unfortunately, the place where he went in was 12 feet. Now, if you run the whole Colorado River, you know, yeah, maybe it's 12 inches or who knows what it is. See, for your patient, it's a problem. And for all of those on the ends of the spectrum, 
It's real simple. That's right. If they don't have, if they don't have elevation, but you would have predicted that before you spent the money and sent the test. The problem is this. Those people in the middle who are real difficult and the, and the, the changeover rate. And of course, what we're always interested in, we're a statistically based group. Again, I can tell how statistically based you are as to whether you're actually down at the tables gambling. Uh, if, if you don't believe in statistics, yeah, go try to, be, to break the house. Uh, it ain't gonna happen. Uh, bottom line though is whenever you have a big variability, there's gonna be patients caught in the middle. It's no good to know the mean. What you have to know is how many people fell out of the mean that would have been missed by the test. That's the basis. And in this test, so they, they, they said, well, it's uh, 1,076 if there's congestive failure, 38 if they're not. This is about a 98% sensitivity, so it wasn't perfect, and a 92% uh, uh, specificity. So it overcalled it by 8%, and that would have missed 2% of people in congestive failure, despite the size of these numbers. There were some people who fell out of the deal. Just understand that. It's not a perfect test. Number two, same journal, same issue of the journal, um, BNP, it was elevated in people who had congestive heart failure, uh, but did not change the therapies. We agree. We agree, but you know what? If they looked like they were in congestive heart failure, what did they do? Treated them for congestive heart failure. So they used some clinical impression of what's going on. Uh, Article 3, uh, here's another, the exact same kind of study. They said, listen to this, they can't agree on what the numbers are. They said, we'll use 47 as the cutoff uh, and, or, you know, in, in our numbers, uh, but it, it, it depends on what you decide the cutoff number will be. And all of these studies, and here's the problem with every one of them, we're going on to study four. All of them pick a different number of BNP. And so there is no... Uh, firm number that we can always use. What about everything else? Let's take their EKG, their chest x-ray, uh, their, you know, we've got their cardiogram, and let's take their echo. Uh, chest x-ray, by the way, probably has the lowest sensitivity of deciding whether they're in congestive failure. It's about two-thirds. So you, and, and, and again, these are people who are going to get an echo, who are going to get all this other kind of stuff. The chest x-ray was right in about two-thirds of the patients. But you know that. You've all seen people who are in clear congestive failure. And the chest, and more than that, they always have ratty old chests anyway, don't they? See, wait, well, what are we doing here? Anyway, uh, re is this God talking to me? <laughs> I didn't mean it. Okay, I didn't do it. If I did, I'm sorry. How do we, why don't we find out what that is, guys? All right. All right, fix it if you can. If you can't, we'll just all move to this side of the room. It's okay. <clears throat> Again, so the chest x-ray carries a miss rate. The EKG, how good is that? Left ventricular hypertrophy, correct? 78% of the time. That means people in frank failure in front of you, one out of five, won't have left ventricular hypertrophy on their, on their EKG. So that isn't perfect either. But now we get to put these things together. Uh, in this particular study, a BMP of 40, similar to the last study, was 90% sensitive. It was better than either chest x-ray or EKG and the echo was at about 91%. Echo was at about 91%. Now, what they then did was said, okay, we'll take these two or three cardiologists and they'll decide as they mix all this stuff together who actually has congestive heart failure and so that's how they, that's how they come up with the numbers. But what I want to point out is the last one said it's a 2% uh, miss. This one says it's a 10% miss. They're not in agreement of how good the test is. Uh, let's skip down five. Five is about the same thing. <clears throat> but
But Article 6 is better. Apparently, the BNP is about as accurate as the initial echo. Well, that reflects exactly what we said back in the, in the other study. BNP about 90%, echo about 91%. They're about equal. And apparently, the BNP is, is uh, Article 6 is from the American Journal of Medicine. Uh, they used a cutoff. They decided they're going to use a cutoff of 107 in their BNP. What does that mean? They're going to miss more, but they're not going to overcall it as often. That, that's sort of what that number means. Um, and again, they're getting into negative predictive values somewhere in the 90% in the range. In between, here, here's uh, Article 8 is worth starring. What they said is, <clears throat> if you have a true quandary about what's going on with the patient, and your BNP number is somewhere between 80 and 300, okay, get the echo as the tiebreaker. Get the echo as the tiebreaker, because they overlapped in different groups. But the point is, you can't take a number like 300 and say, or 250, and say, oh, they're congestive failure. Because it isn't that good. The test isn't that good. What I really like in medicine is, is the, uh, is the uh, pregnancy test. <laughs> Do you ever realize how good that test is? If it says you're pregnant, if it turns blue, at the 99.3% level, you're pregnant. Okay? The pretest probability is actually pretty good. Reproducible age female missed a period. Okay? <laughs> Uh, and now it's 99.3% accurate. I love that test. I think it ought to be mandatory on everybody, females. Uh, but this test isn't that good. And so what you realize is you get back a number which you have to use clinical judgment on. It's real easy, when the no it, again, when it's grandma who's got foam coming out of her mouth and the number's 4,000. You didn't need the number anyway. You set off a useless test. It's real easy when it's a 12-year-old who's hacking up sputum. You didn't need, yeah, and the BNP is 30. You didn't need the number anyway. But in that intermediate group, what you, what you need to do is say, not accurate enough, we need a tiebreaker at this moment in time. And then you take your, your echo, your EKG, your chest x-ray, and put them together. Uh, uh, to come up with go, what, what's going on. By the way, if the BNP says you're getting dilation of your left ventricle, that's what it says, is that a predictor of how you're going to do over the next uh, 90 days? The answer is, or is the next six months? It actually is. People who come in with elevated BNPs uh, have a worse prognosis at, at, uh, nine, at six months than people who have a normal BNP. But you knew that already, because the most common cause of death in old people in this country is what? Congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure is the single largest DRG in the country. If you look at how many people are admitted every year to hospitals, it's about a million in the United States with congestive heart failure. So it also told you something which you already knew which is if grandma has congestive heart failure, is she going to do worse than, than the, the age-matched woman who does not have congestive heart failure? Yes, she will. But you can walk in and say, Grandma, you got a high BMP. Buy your jelly beans one at a time. Okay? <laughs> don't make any big investments. Okay? I, I, I just don't think it has... It's interesting. It just doesn't have any usefulness. Um, <clears throat> Uh, article 10, which, by the way, is a very good article, uh, Academic Emergency Medicine, 2003. In patients with pulmonary disease, um, uh, if, if you're at about 100, see, they decided to use the cutoff of 100, then they think they had a, and by the way, to get into their study, you had to have pulmonary disease as well. You had to have COPD or something like that, and this is always where the question comes up is, is grandma short of breath? because of her COPD, or is her heart failure worse? And what they said was, if, there, if the BNP was above 100, 
uh, we would have we would have uh, only missed about seven percent. But again, it's getting more. You know, again, this, this sort of ninety percent kind of level. That's about where it is if you use that number. Uh, Eleven, twelve. Again, they used a cutoff of one sixty-two. Ninety percent accurate. What about if you combine the chest X-ray, Article 13, with BNP? There is a very poor correlation. We'd like to think that with this enzyme, with this hormone, that if your left ventricular distension gets worse, that number ought to go up, right? It ought to be bigger. And your chest X-ray ought to be worse, right? Again, when grandma's got foam out her mouth, and we know that she's in bad shape, the BNP ought to be high. No, there wasn't. The BNP was elevated, but there were people who looked perfectly good who had high BNPs, and people who only had minim minimally elevated BNPs, so you can't say that the chest X-ray correlates with the absolute height of the BNP. It's not linear, because there are certain people that when you've expanded their left ventricle over time, they've run out of BNP. Okay? If it's a sudden increase, you're probably going to have some BNP left. Let's say this has been going on for a long time. What's happened? See, it's like people with, with liver disease. What happens at the end of liver disease? What happens to, to, your, to your liver your factors that you measure in the blood? They go down. Why? Because your liver's dead now. Okay? Initially, it went real high. Now you're near the end of your life. They're going back down again. Very strange stuff. Um, question 12. What about pro-BNP? You all know that... We're now, it's as soon as we come out with one thing, somebody says, well, let's check another molecule, which is pro-BNP. What's the problem with pro-BNP? First of all, it's a test which is not available everywhere. Number two, the test costs about eight times as much to run. Did it tell us anything we didn't already know with BNP? No, it didn't. So if you want an expensive test that doesn't help you, ask your lab to get pro-BNP. And there is no data to suggest it's any better than anything else. All right. Uh, where are we now? Question three. What are the pitfalls in interpretation? Whenever you look at these numbers, I just want to review this with you. What is the gold standard? Did they do an echo? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If it's just a man's opinion, uh, or two or three cardiologists, or a gang of cardiologists, What's, I don't know what the correct term is for a grouping of cardiologists. Like there's a gaggle of geese, okay, and a pride of lions. Okay, well, maybe there's a, uh, you know, a, 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 a huddle of cardiologists or whatever it is. Uh, it's not enough. Uh, whenever BNP versus the echo, uh, the correlation is also relatively poor, and the cutoff value that, that they have particularly decided is in their study is okay, here's the question you have to ask. In my hospital, what test are we using and what cutoff are they using? Because that will tell you what the positive and negative predictive value is of the test. Am I missing 7%? Am I missing 3%? What am I missing at that moment in time? Um, the best two summary articles are here are uh, 18 is from the Canadian Journal of Emergency Medicine, 2003. It's Hole's article. His conclusion is a very good one. That is, he says, the BNP has a place, but it is incredibly limited. That is, if you really have people with pulmonary disease and heart disease, and you want to try and differentiate out worsening of the pulmonary disease versus the congestive heart failure, and you're willing to tie the BNP to like the echo results together, then it has a function. But at the ends of the spectrum, it probably doesn't help you out any, and it only confuses the picture. 19 suggests this. In a general rule, with various tests that are out there, Below about 50, and then they'll expand that to 80 with certain of the tests, there's probably no heart failure. Okay? Above 1,000, they're probably in heart failure. Okay? Let's, let's just let's say that, that that's coming. But in the gray area, we talked about the gray area before, whether it's in your lab 
whether that's between 80 or 100 and 250 or 300. In their picture, they say between uh, you know, 50 and 400. They were pretty liberal about the thing. Um, uh, about half the patients in that gray area in their study, which is a big study, had congestive heart failure when they finally put everything else together. But when you get a number back, uh, and by the way, this is, the, this is Schwann's article, uh, 2004, star it. I think that, that 18 and 19 are the summary of where we are at this moment in time. And what they say is, in that gray zone, clinical judgment, uh, the echo, the EKG, then you can put everything together and say, this is as close as we can come uh, to an answer. But half the patients who were be in the gray zone when looked at by cardiologists who had the results of the echo, the chest x-ray, and the EKG, one half of them were considered not to have congestive heart failure, which means one half of them were, and yet they didn't have those astronomical numbers. Again, above 1,000, not a problem. At 4,000, terrific. Okay, that's what they've got. What do you do with the mid-zone patient? And what they basically say is you still have to apply the other testing and clinical judgment. Yes, ma'am. So the primary that one and without anything else. And then you get something in the gray zone. You get one that's 38 and then you're below 250. Right. Would that be applicable without meaning I no, I think that if you've got the, the first of all, there's a sampling error question. Now it's 250. What's the history that goes with that? What does the patient look like? And you know what? To settle that issue, that might be a reasonable place for the, uh, for, for the echo. By the way, if they've come over from the office with chest pain, and let's say they ordered a BNP and now it's 250, my first thought is they're, ex they're expanding their left ventric uh, ventricle because they're losing pumping function. They're having an acute MI. I mean, in, in, that, in the face of that discussion, I would be working up the, more for the acute MI than anything else. And, and remember, you can have both processes going on simultaneously. Because if you've killed a little muscle and now and you're losing some pumping power and you're stretching that left, left ventricle, um, I would also make sure to see what the troponin and, and, and uh, the, you know, the EKG and the CK and stuff like that is at that moment in time. Because if I've seen a change like that in a short period of time, there's something, there's something odd going on. Okay, um, any, any questions about this? How many people here are using this test very much? How many people are seeing people misuse this test all the time? You see, I think you order, order a test when you need to have another piece of data which will actually take you from point A to point B. And if it won't do that, then don't get the test. And, I, and my, my only fear is I've got people who make this mistake. Oh, well, they've got, they've got a, a BNP of only 180. So that can't be congestive heart failure. That kind of thinking happens all the time. And you know, if it doesn't right, if it doesn't look right, it doesn't smell right, it's in that gray zone, don't conclude based on that number that they don't have congestive heart failure. But by the way, will other things ex raise the BNP? If you throw a big enough PE, Will that increase your ventricular, your, 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 the size of your ventricles? Yeah. By the way, the right ventricle has some of that in it, just like the left ventricle does. Now, we always think about the left ventricle. But if you throw in a big PE and the right ventricle is kicking out against that, and now you're getting right ventricular dilatation, you can do it. So you could say, well, God, you know, chest x-ray looks OK. EKG doesn't show it. I don't really think that, I think that's a spurious BNP. I think that 500 probably doesn't mean much. You know what? I wouldn't fall into that either. If the story doesn't, if the story doesn't sound right, you can't go with that number and say, oh, gee, well, it's a little congestive heart failure. No. In the scenario I just gave you, it's, it's the, the PE that they just threw. And I think you've uh, you got to think about that. Any questions about this? Sir? Most of these papers don't talk about the change in BNP. Uh, if you're looking for rapid changes, 
uh, you know, following something up like that, you've got some sort of acute process which is, which is, which is affecting the ventricle. And, and uh, that's different than being in chronic congestive heart failure. Right. It's being chronic congestive heart failure. So, so I don't think, nobody's published a paper yet that says it's another way of diagnosing the new MI or anything like that. Well, but, Yeah. Okay. And then the guy who got a BMP when they sent him home five days later, and it was six times. Now they're back in the ER a week later. Okay. The, the, the BMP of 400 tell me anything or not? Does not. Yeah. It does not. One of the paper, remember, one of the papers I, I quoted say, could we correlate the absolute height of the BNP with the amount of the left ventricular hypertrophy? And so they took people, they showed the echo. To say, oh, here's a big flabby heart, that ought to be high BNP. The answer was, no, it wasn't. And so we'd like to have that. Unfortunately, this doesn't take us where we want to go yet. I think it's like a lot of ideas in medicine. We're working through it. I don't think we understand historical change while we're a part of it. And so I'm sure in five years we'll understand more where this thing fits on the scale. We just haven't come up to that yet. Uh, what I would do is... Uh, is sit down with your own group and talk about when are we going to get it, how are we going to limit it, uh, and, and uh, here's what the cardiologists would like, I think. Some of them would like to say, oh, well, that makes the diagnosis, so just stick them in. Or someone would say, I don't have to see them tonight. Or you really don't need an echo now, you know, to get out of work. Well, just don't think that, that you have made the correct uh, the diagnosis by just sending them a number. And all the cardiologists read this literature. They understand that fully, that, that this is a test where we're waiting to see what it's going to do. I all, it's also a test that every one of my residents believes that when they see somebody with shortness of breath, they're going to get just to rule out congestive heart failure. And that's, not, that's an incorrect way of using this testing. It does not meet the criteria of what needs to happen. Okay? Question. Yeah. The company's literature indicates that it's really a relatively short half-life of being between uh, six hours or something like that. But it's, uh, that it's important to get, a, you, even if you know the patient has a CHF, it's important to get a baseline BNP because the, the patient's, uh, this is what they're saying, that the patient's uh, outcome and, uh, and treatment uh, can be followed by the, the level of the BNP. The, the outcome of the patient, say 15 or 30 day admission, is correlated more with the, as much with the, their discharge BNP as their actual how they feel. Here's my counter to that. Okay. They're right that people who had a high BNP, did they do worse? Yes. Am I going to withdraw therapy because of it? You see, what they don't claim and they shouldn't claim is, well, here's the people you should just withhold therapy on because they're going to die anyway. Or here's the people who you ought to give extra nitro to. We don't have that yet. They are correct. See, I understand why they want, want to sell more tests. I, I understand that perfectly. The point is nobody has published a paper yet that says, how are we going to change our therapy on the congestive heart failure patient based on the BNP? There's not one paper in the literature which tells us that. And even though they're right that, that the 15% will be dead at the end of uh, 90 days, how is that going to affect your treatment of John Smith, who's in there? You see, I understand where they're coming from from a promotional standpoint, but if anybody here actually has a paper which says, you get therapy and you're so far down the drain that, Jack, we're just going to kiss you goodbye. I mean, the British would love that paper. There's no question about it. If the British got a hold of that paper and it was good, they would do it in a nanosecond. But it's not there. 